Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Hong Kong IS. Um, IS stands for Institute for Advanced Study. And I'm Jacob Huang, uh, the Executive Director of Hong Kong IS. Uh, in this semester, we launched for a new lecture series um, called Rising Star uh, Lectures for our young scholar. And, and many young professors complain to me, so why he not me? I said, probably you are already the star, so you don't need to be rising anymore. Uh, but today, we have very really three distinguished young professors. You can see uh, their outstanding uh, performance and outcomes. And uh, we already finished four series uh, on mathematics, chemistry, physics, material science. Today is the last one, supposed the best one, right? Save for the last and uh, on life science. Uh, original call uh, biomedical science, but Professor Sir Collins say life science is a better word, okay? So we have changed on life science. And we have three speakers today. And the first one will be given by Dr. Gigi Peiji Lu. Okay, Lu Peizhi Jiaoshou. And she obtained her bachelor degree uh, in chemistry with a first class honors in 2001, and then a PhD degree from Chinese U in 2005. And then she pursued her postdoc training at the Division of Biophysics and Bio imaging of Ontario's Cancer Institute uh, in 2006 to 8. Okay? Uh, where she uh, developed her research interest in small uh, serenostic agents for cancer diagnosis and treatment. And during 2009 and 2014, she was appointed as a research assistant professor uh, in Department of Chemistry in Chinese U. Um, and then she joined Department of Biomedical Science of CTU uh, as assistant professor in 2015. And she was recently substantiated and promoted to associate professor uh, in 2021. Congratulations, yeah. And Professor Lu's main research interests uh, include develop or advanced uh, photo sentinelizing system for photodynamics therapy and the use of a uh, super molecular and the bio orthogonal chemistry for size specific uh, drug delivery and activation. Uh, since joining CTU, Dr. Lu has received the SPPJPP uh, Young Investigator Award in the 11th International Conference on um, Paul for years. And uh, boy, Sarger Sinai, something like that. Uh, it's all chemistry name. Okay. So, Professor Luz has authored uh, more than 90 publications with a total citation near 4,000 and an H index around 40, including papers in uh, Chemical Society Reviews. Uh, Andrew wanted Chimit International Edition at the uh, Bio uh, Material Journal of Control Release, ACS Applied Materials and Interface, and Journal of uh, Medical uh, Chemistry. So, uh, very, very distinguished. Uh, as she is the first female scholar, young scholar, in our whole series. So, leave me give a very warm applause. Back to uh, thanks, Professor Kwang, uh, your kind introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm grateful to the HKIAS uh, for selecting me as one of the rising star in the field of the life science. Uh, I would also like to thank the dean, uh, the heads, and also the chair professors in the college uh, for their nominations and support. 
uh, it's my great honor to stand here to give the uh, Rising Star Lectures. And in this lecture, I would like to share with you some of my recent work on the development of advanced nanophotosanitizing system for target photodynamic therapy. First of all, uh, let me introduce what is photodynamic therapy. We call uh, PDT, it is a promising therapeutic modality for the treatment of cancer. It uh, involves uh, three components. Uh, the first one is the photosensitizer, and also uh, light and also oxygen. When we use the appropriate wavelength of light to excite the photosensitizer, it will excite it to the excited signal state and through the intersystem crossing, this excited signal state will convert to the triplet excited state. This triplet excited state photosanitizer can undergo the type 1 uh, electron transfer reactions with the biomolecules to generate this reactive oxygen species, or it can also undergo the energy transfer reactions with monocular oxygen to generate the signal oxygen. These reactive oxygen species, they can cause the cellular and the tissue damage. There are three anti-tumor mechanisms for the PDT. First of all, the photodynamic therapy can induce the direct cell damage through the necrosis or aprotosis. It can also cause the uh, vascular shutdown to stop the supply of the nutrition to the tumor region. It can also activate the in real response to fight for the cancer. However, nowadays there are only few clinically approved PTT agents. The most common one we call this is the photofin. This is the first generation photosensitizers. And there are few second generation photosensitizers. All these photosensitizers, they are the porphyrin uh, derivatives, and they do not have any uh, tumor selectivity. So that uh, uh, there is still uh, uh, demand for the development of new type of photosanitizer that can target to the tumor specifically. If compared with the traditional uh, anti-cancer therapy like the chemotherapy or radiation therapy, PDT exhibits several uh, advantages. For example, it is relatively non-invasive and it has the spatial temporal selectivity through the use of the uh, optical fiber to shine the light on the target region. Repeated dose can be given without any uh, total dose limitation associated with the uh, radiotherapy. It also do not have any, it, it also does not have any multi-drug resistant problem occur in the, chemo, in the chemotherapy. Uh, the healing process is fast and do not have any scarring and only have, uh, there's no significant side effect. And the PDT treatment can be done in the outpatients or the daycare uh, setting. However, there are still some challenge for the PDT that limit its uh, clinical application. For example, as I mentioned, the approved PDT agent, they only have very low selectivity between the tumor and the healthy tissue and it has the long drug to light uh, interval and also have prolonged skin photosensitivity. As I mentioned, the PDT, the type two mechanism requires the oxygen so that the oxygen dependent nature of PDT hampers its applications to treat the hypoxic tumor. And the light penetration depth also is uh, very crucial uh, for the PDT efficacy. And so that uh, to enhance uh, the selectivity of the photosanitizer, different researchers focus on the development uh, of the photosanitizer that have targeting property or by making use of the activatable photosanitizer. Uh, through the conjugation of the photosanitizer with the tumor targeting ligands, it can achieve the active targeting. For example, we can conjugate some proteins peptides or small molecules that can deliver the photosanitizer into the tumor region. Or we can prepare uh, uh, the activatable photosanitizer in which the photodynamic activities can only be turned on in the tumor environment so that it can enhance the tumor selectivity of the photosanitizer. Or we can encapsulate the photosanitizer into the nano carriers so that it can achieve the passive targeting through the enhanced permeability and retention effect. 
Other strategies also be explored to overcome the limit tissue penetration of light, for example, making use of the photoconverting nanoparticles. We can excite the photosensitizer using the near infrared uh, night or using the X-ray, or by the development of the cell luminescent uh, self-luminescent nanoparticles. It can cooperate with the photosensitizer so that uh, it can achieve uh, the PDT for the deep seed tumors. To overcome the oxygen-dependent nature of the uh, PDT, uh, the researcher also uh, tried to use different methods, for example, to deliver the oxygen uh, using the hemoglobin or peripheral carbon to deliver the oxygen to the tumor tissues, or through the uh, uh, reactions, uh, the, cat uh, the catalase. Okay? The catalase can convert the hydrogen peroxide and reach in the tumor regions to the oxygen so that the oxygen can be provided for the photodynamic actions or can incorporate with some of the drug that can inhibit the cellular respiration so that sparing more oxygen for the photodynamic therapy. Over the years, I have been working on the monocular and nanophenolic agents for the target PDP with a view to overcoming the limitations of PDT and facilitating its clinical uh, translation, uh, clinical applications. Uh, this slide shows you some of the examples of the monocular-based photosensitizer developed by um, our group. And uh, by making use of this phyrocyanase or the boron dipyro the boron dipyromethane, uh, this, we use these two as the photosanitizer to generate the signal oxygen. We prepare the activatable one. You can see we conjugate with the disulfide linker, make it become the GSH responsive, or making use of the uh, ketone linkage and the disulfide linkage so that this compound will be responsible, uh, will be responsive to the GSH and also uh, the acidic pH. Apart from the monocular uh, system, we are also interested in the nano uh, photosensitizing system. And by making use of the mesoporous silicon nanoparticles, uh, we can encapsulate the photosensitizer inside, uh, and also we can uh, incorporate the photosensitizer together with the anti-cancer drug to achieve the controlled release of the drug. Apart from the uh, inorganic nanoparticle, we also use the uh, polymer. We also use the polymer to encapsulate the uh, photosanitizer and the anti-cancer drug to achieve the combined therapy. Apart from using the uh, inorganic nanoparticles and the polymeric uh, uh, micelles, we have also developed a facial strategies. We, uh, by the supermolecular chemistry, we uh, use the uh, we can achieve the cell, we can prepare the self assembled nanoparticles. We will uh, show some of the details of this work in this talk. Okay, this is the first example I want to uh, show you. Uh, in this uh, example, in this polymer, we conjugate the doxorubicin, this is the anti cancer drug, uh, through the hydrosome linkage to the side chain of this polymer. And we also conjugate the same phyllocyanase through the disulfide linker into this uh, polymer. And this polymer uh, with the polyethylene glycol, when, once we put into the water, they can self-assemble to form this polymeric micelles. And all the phyllocyanase will be entrapped in the core of the micelles so that because the uh, phyllocyanase, they are stacked together so that the photosensitizing properties can be silent. Okay, it cannot generate signal oxygen in this form. And we expected that uh, upon the internalizations into the cells, and because of the acidic environment in the endosome and the lysosome, the dosorbicin can be released and then to achieve the chemotherapeutic effect. At the same time, because the high, sorry, the ponta doesn't work very well, okay. And in, in the presence of the high GSH level in the cytoplasm, uh, the phyllocyanase can also be released so that when we shine the light on that region, it can react with the monocular oxygen to generate the signal oxygen for the cellular damage. And based on the previous work, in this work, we additionally add another therapeutic agent together. We call this is the uh, TPZ. This is the hypoxia-activated drug. Uh, under the hypoxia condition, this TPZ 
uh, product can undergo the bio uh, reductions and to generate this uh, to generate this uh, TP set uh, radical. And we use the polymer and we encapsulate the same phylosane with the doxorubicin conjugate together. We link up these two therapeutic agents through the hydrosome linkage so that uh, this becomes the prodrug and the anti-cancer effect of the phylosane and the doxorubicin can be silent. And upon internalization into the cancer cells in the lysosomes and the uh, endosomes because of the acidic pH, and this two, the phylosanase, the phylosanase and also the dosorbazin will be separate. Then to exert the chemo, uh, chemo effect and also the uh, photodynamic uh, effect. And because of the PDT actions, the oxygen level in the cell will be lower and to in, and induce the hypoxia status in the cancer cell. So that this product, the TP set product, will be activated to form this TP set uh, radicals to exert additional therapeutic effect. And this slide shows the structural and spectroscopic characterization of these nanoparticles uh, without the TPZ, uh, with the TPZ, and this is with the phylosane only, without the dosorbicin. We also examine the absorption and also the fluorescence uh, properties of these nanoparticles in organic solvent and in the aqueous solution. In the organic solvent, they are in the free state, and uh, they are in the free form. And in the uh, aqueous solutions, the nanoparticles uh, is formed, and so that the phylosanase and the dosorbicin will be aggregated into the in the core of the nanoparticle, so that uh, the absorption will be lower, and also uh, the fluorescence uh, will be uh, uh, inhibited. And we treat the nanoparticles with the uh, cancer cells. This is the HC20 line uh, colon cancer cell. And we also compare with the free uh, drug. And upon the treatment with this uh, my cells, with the cells, and we can see the fluorescence of the same phylosanase, indicating that the same phylosanase already released in the uh, cellular level. And we can also observe the uh, for instance, of the doxorubicin, it also indicating that uh, the doxorubicin is separate from the same PC so that it can release out and then, uh, ex and then uh, exert the therapeutic effect. And you can see um, uh, the localization of doxorubicin is uh, around the nucleus. And we mentioned that the, uh, these nanoparticles uh, can uh, uh, trigger, okay, can activate the TP set the TP set project, and so that we check the RS generation and also the hypoxia status of the cells, and we found that for all these uh, my cells, uh, it can generate the reactive oxygen species significantly, and at the same time, it can induce the hypoxia status so that it can in turn to activate the TP set project into the uh, radical. And we examine the cytotoxicity uh, in dark and also uh, with the light under the normal conditions or under the hypoxia conditions. And we found that the combination uh, of the same, the same PC dogs and the TP set, they show the uh, highest cytotoxicity, no matter in the normal conditions or hypoxia condition. And then uh, at last, we, ex uh, we perform the in vivo uh, studies and we want to know the power distributions of the nanoparticle and uh, we compare with the free drug and we found that using the my cells to encapsulate the uh, uh, the same PC dox conjugate it can enhance the tumor accumulations and we can see the fluorescence light up and uh, we also found that uh, the one with the uh, uh, the nano system it shows uh, the enhanced uh, tumor accumulation and this is the in vitro anti-tumor uh, efficacy. And we also demonstrate that the same PC dogs with the TPZ, the micelle, in the, uh, in the presence of the light irradiation, it shows uh, the, the best anti-tumor efficiency. We can see the uh, higher degree for the tumor regression. Apart from using the polymer, we also explore uh, other approach uh, for the care, we, we claim this is the carrier-free nanoparticles. In this 
work uh, by making use of some uh, small peptide and also uh, through the covalent interaction between the photosensitizer and the, and the therapeutic agents, we found that these molecules uh, can, can self-assemble to form the sing sunny nanoparticle, or it can co-assemble with the anti-cancer drug dosorbicins to form this, uh, the corresponding nanoparticle. And upon the internalization, this assembled nanoparticle will undergo the disassemble so that release the therapeutic agent and to exert the therapeutic effect or to exert the PDT effect. And for this one, okay, uh, we want to overcome the oxygen uh, dependence nature of the PDT so that uh, by making use of uh, the iron, okay, the iron, okay, uh, Inspired by the natural occurring catalase, okay, we uh, want to encapsulate the iron, and this uh, ferric iron can uh, can convert the hydrogen peroxide in the tumor region to the oxygen, so that the oxygen can be provided uh, for the PDT actions. And we found that the ferric iron can assemble with this f moxicillins through the metal coordination driven assemble process to form the nano vesicle. And in this uh, formation process, we can encapsulate the sing cyanase or together with the ACF aquafilin, uh, the anti-cancer, uh, the inhibitor together, so that to form uh, the corresponding nanoparticle. And these nanoparticles are quite stable uh, in the aqueous solution and also in the serum containing nanoparticles. And we hypothesis that upon the internalization, uh, the nanoparticle will disassemble and the release ion can catalyze the hydrogen peroxide and which in the tumor regions to the oxygen. And this oxygen can relieve the hypoxia status of the cells. And the same file upon the irradiation, it can generate the ROS to uh, extract the cellular damage. For the aquafilin, this one can inhibit the hybridization of HIF1 alpha and HIF1 alpha, uh, HI1 HIF1 beta and uh, blocking, block, uh, blocking the pathway to promote the tumor uh, cell at the tumor growth. And this slide shows the structural and also the spectroscopic characterization of this nanoparticle. And uh, you can see the TDM image. This is the nano vesicle. And uh, with the uh, DLS measurement, uh, the size is quite small, 160 to 180, with the negative theta potential, which is favor for the in vivo study. And we also found that uh, this nanoparticles, upon the addition of the hydrogen peroxide, it can generate the oxygen uh, efficiency. Okay? And we can also see the consumption of the hydrogen peroxide. And uh, under the normal conditions or hypoxia conditions, these nanoparticles can generate the signal oxygen e uh, efficiency. And uh, these nanoparticles are stable in water and also in the uh, culture medium. However, upon the treatment with the glutathione, uh, it is enriched in the cyto cytoplasm. Uh, this nanoparticle will be uh, disassembled, and based on the TM image, you can see the nanostructure was dis uh, disrupted. And uh, it will cause the disassemble of the same PC, ACF, and also the iron metal. And we treat the uh, nanoparticle, we treat the cancer cells with the nanoparticles, and we found that uh, no matter under the normal conditions or hypoxia conditions, this nanoparticle can generate the reactive oxygen species uh, successfully. And uh, you can see that for the, uh, the phalsanase, without these iron metals, you can see the RS generation is hardly uh, generated under the hypoxia condition. We also found that this nanoparticle can lower the level of the HIF1 alpha and also uh, to relieve the hypoxia uh, condition. And then we study the cytotoxicities of this nanoparticle uh, under uh, the normal conditions or the hypoxia condition uh, in the dark or with the light treatment. And we found that with the light treatment, uh, the nanoparticles uh, containing the iron uh, and also the uh, sing on and also the ACF with these two therapeutic components together, it exhibit uh, hydrous photosyrotoxicity. And uh, further, we uh, 
examined the bulk distribution of this nanoparticle in the tumor-bearing mice, and we found that this nanoparticle can accumulate into the tumor through the enhanced permeability and retention effect. And uh, we also uh, get the tumor out and also uh, check the status of the tumor, and we found that uh, after treatment with the nanoparticles, uh, the hypoxia status of the uh, tumor can be relieved. And we also found that we also found that uh, the one the nanoparticle with the phosphonase with the ACF together with the light treatment, you can see that it shows highest uh, tumor regression, and there's no uh, significant side effect uh, for all this uh, condition. Okay, at last, okay, uh, in conclusion, uh, our group have been focused on the development of the monocular base and the polymeric base nail particle, and we found that the phosphonase can combine with other anti-cancer drugs, for example, the dosorubicin, uh, the TP set for the combined therapy, and under uh, certain ratios, okay, the synergistic effect could be achieved. And uh, we have also developed the facial uh, strategies to prepare the self-assembled nanoparticles. And uh, through the cooperation of the ion, uh, ions, uh, we can uh, overcome the limitations of the PDT. Uh, we can provide the uh, additional oxygens uh, in the cancer cell and so that to, to treat the hypoxic tumor. Okay, uh, at last, okay, I would like to thank my uh, uh, past students and also the current students uh, for their uh, hard working and to generate the data. Uh, okay, uh, Gao Di, she's uh, worked on the polymeric system. Now she is an assistant professor in, the, in Xi'an Jiao Tong University. And uh, uh, Yong Xin, she worked on the self-assembled nanoparticle. Now she is the assistant professor in uh, Qingdao University. And I would also like to thank uh, my collaborators and also uh, the, uh, the financial support. And at last but not least, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any question from the audience? Yes, Bruce. So very nice talk. Uh, we have a microphone. Uh, yeah. Very nice talk and uh, congratulations on your success. Um, I'm going to ask one very simple question and then a much more difficult one. The simple question is, is photodynamic therapy a primary cancer treatment for any human cancer? Uh, for the photodynamic therapy, this is the clinically approved therapy for the uh, uh, most likely use for the uh, skin cancer, very common. So okay. this, this is cancer. the primary. Anything else, any solid tumors? Uh, solid tumor, uh, esophagus cancer. Yeah, because uh, as I mentioned, it requires the light. Okay, so that the delivery of light is very important. You can get yes, there. but uh, in Canada or and also in Australia, this is commonly used for the skin cancer, esophagus cancer, and also uh, 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 some of the topical cancer. Yeah. So uh, that's straightforward. The difficult question is this: the cancers that kill are cancers that are not discovered early. Mm. Pancreatic cancer is the classic example. Mm. So I see some difficulties or challenges related to a tumor that spread to many other organs. I'm not so sure I want any of this therapy if I have a malignant uh, uh, metastasis in my brain uh, because there could be a lot of innocent cells killed. Mm. So what about metastatic cancer? I think the photodynamic therapy can only be used to treat the local cancer, the localized cancer, but not for the metastatic cancer. Yeah. Only the localized. I would like to ask a personal question. Two years ago, mm. I had a prostate cancer, mm. second stage. I was recommend to take radiation treatment, you know, for nine weeks, like uh, five minutes per day. Uh, no doubt, the radiation power wavelengths are much shorter than yours. Mm -hmm. So my question is this: uh, in comparison, so any advantage of your technique, or is your technique you widely used in hospital now, or no? 
uh, for the photodynamic therapy, it's not common in Hong Kong. But I know in China and also in the European country and uh, and also in the state in the Canada, they use it uh, as the second, uh, not not the first line. Okay, not the first line therapy, but just uh, uh, together with other uh, therapy like the chemotherapy and also after the surgery, they may also. Uh, do the uh, photodynamic therapy. For the photodynamic therapy, as I mentioned, uh, there's some uh, advantage. For example, for the radiotherapy, they have the total dose limitation. But for the PDT, it do not have any limitation for the dosage. You can do it uh, alternative day. Yeah. And also, uh, compare with the uh, conventional therapy, it's less uh, invasive. I mean, for my radiation, but there are little bit side effect. Mm. But so far, I'm okay. You can see, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Wong, uh, Gigi, very interesting. The, the in your cell studies, when you use a ferric iron, mm. try to generate more oxygen from the hydrogen peroxide. Mm. So where does the hydrogen peroxide come from normally? in your cells and where they go. You normally you have a catalyst with some other enzyme able to remove. And also you need to have a source, superoxide mm. N9, and then through SOD convert into hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Well, Actually, yeah. in the literature, we found that uh, the tumor tissues usually have higher concentrations of the hydrogen peroxide if compared with the normal tissues. But in our cell work study, we try to uh, just use the cancer cell line without adding the hydrogen peroxide. And we also found it can generate the oxygen, but not in a very high content. So that in, my cellular, in the cellular studies, and we additionally add some hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. so that uh, yes. to promote the effect for the generation of oxygen. Because naturally, if cells produce hydrogen peroxide, uh, because we're working on the, the the vascular function actually is a bipotent with dilators. Mm -hmm. And the hydrogen products are able to be secreted uh, from endothelial cells, for example, and then for your cancer cell epithelial cells. And if that surrounding area have a, a lot of blood vessels, small one, mm. that, that can be, you know, the vessel dilatation can be induced by hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Oh, this, uh, uh, this uh, therapy normally used in uh, what stage, early stage, or you after operation? That's the second line you say mentioned. Uh, I, I know, I, I actually, I, uh, for this photodynamic therapy, I just read some uh, uh, literature. They mentioned that uh, it will combine with the PDT usually will not be the first line uh, therapeutic uh, treatment modality, but it will combine with other uh, uh, traditional, uh, other traditional uh, therapy, like the chemotherapy uh, after the surgery, and uh, I'm I'm not sure whether it will. I, I'm not sure uh, the the stage of the cancer, you you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That's an excellent talk, Professor Lu. Let's thank you again. Thank you. Our second speaker will be Dr. Liang Zhang, Zhang Liang Jiao Shou. And he received his bachelor degree from Peking, Peking University in 2001 and PhD degree from University of Iowa in 2007. After graduation, he continued work as a postdoc and research scientist for nine years in Nulafel uh, Research Institute in Toronto, Canada. Uh, in the uh, dissecting his, uh, the signaling mechanism or cancel uh, metastasis, and then in 2016, he joined CTU as assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Science. And Dr. Zhang's research focused on uh, proteoid uh, mix and the cancer signaling to uh, elucidate the mechanism by which the cancer cell and the tumor 
micro environment communicate with each other. And Professor Zhang's uh, special interest in describing the protein protein and protein RNA interaction that underlie the biological process. And from Dr. Zhang's website, there's a good saying say, no protein works for nothing, no protein works alone, no protein works without regulation. Okay? And Professor Zhang has co-authored so many papers with a total Google citation of more than 2,000 times, and including the paper in Cells, Nature Methods, Jace, Nature Communication, and so on. So let's give a warm applause to Dr. Uh, Zhang. All right. Thank you. And uh, first, I'd like to thank Professor Huang and the Institute for awarding me this great honor. And also, I'd like to thank all the senior colleagues in the college for nominating me. And uh, also, uh, I'd like to uh, thank all my colleagues for their support. And uh, basically, uh, I appreciate all this uh, support. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about my research, which is basically at the interface of uh, uh, the proteomics and the cell signaling. And first, I'd like to uh, make a brief introduction of uh, proteomics. Uh, we all know the central dogma of biology, and we have our um, genomic DNA packed in the nucleus of the cells, and then they will be transcribed into the RNA which will later be translated into the protein. And as Professor Huang said on my website, basically I said the proteins are the uh, workhorse of our cells, and they are the major component of the cell, and they, they are major executor of the functions, and they determine the uh, cellular type and the, our phenotype as well. So the understanding of central dogma is accompanied by the development of uh, biotechnology. And we all know that recently the development of next generation sequencing have enabled us to sequence our uh, genomic DNA and as well as the RNA, the so-called uh, genomics and the transcriptomics, okay? And then in this way we can uh, determine our genotype of an individual, we know the uh, DNA sequence, we know its copy number of the genes, and then uh, this have boosted our development of the precision medicine in which the genome sequencing can help us decide the uh, diagnosis as well as the therapeutic strategies. And our research actually focuses on the product of the uh, DNA and RNA, which are the proteins. And as I said, they are the functional molecules in our cells. And by studying the so-called proteotype of using the proteomics, we, can, we hope that we can find some novel uh, contributions in the, to the precision medicine as well to boost uh, human health. So basically, the prototype uh, are currently studied mainly by using the advanced uh, machine mass spectrometry. And then with the help of it, we can decide also the sequences of a protein as well as its copy numbers. And also the integration with other technology like uh, X-ray crystallography as well as now the newly developed uh, computation are AI, and then we can determine the protein structure as well. But with the, all this information, it's still far from knowing the so-called prototype. That's because uh, the proteins are much more complicated. And uh, for example, for the proteins of the same sequence, and they can be subject to different covalent modifications, such as phosphorylation, ubiquitination, glycosylation, and so on. And all these covalent modifications in collection, they are called the post-translational modifications. And they are actually the deciding factor for the function of the proteins. For example, the protein of the same sequence can be, when they are modified differently, they can have different fate and a different function. So one challenge of the proteomics is to decide the pro, uh, PTMs of individual proteins. 
And in addition to that, there is another uh, challenge, like uh, Professor Huang quoted from my website, is that no protein works alone. So basically, um, proteins, they also form complexes with other biomolecules, such as other proteins, or DNA, or RNA, or like the lipid compound as well. And their functional uh, complexes with this actually decided their functional outcomes. And so that's another challenge in proteomics that is to study the so-called interactome of individual proteins. So the research in my lab actually study in uh, the basic research direction as well as the translational direction. So on the basic reaction, uh, basic uh, research direction, we actually study the uh, develop new technologies using quantitative proteomics as well as bioinformatics to study the protein interactome as well as the PTMs of the protein. And on the translational direction, we use the uh, proteomics and bioinformatics as well to try to identify new biomarkers for disease as well as drug targets to promote uh, precision medicine. And today, due to the time, I'll just focus on two aspects highlighted here. And the first one is uh, how we study protein interactome. So basically, in my lab, the study of uh, uh, protein interactome is facilitated by the technology called the proximity ligation. So in this technology, uh, we have a protein of uh, uh, interest that we are want to identify its interactome. We will tag it to a protein called the uh, epitope tag, tag called the protein biotin ligase, which is shown here. And once it's expressed in the cell, we can uh, give the cell some biotin molecules. And then the biotin ligase will activate this biotin, and which make it uh, active to be conjugated to the nearby molecules, mainly proteins. And then with that, we can uh, tag all the interacting proteins of our protein of interest with biotin. And this can facilitate the downstream uh, isolation with the uh, streptavidin, which is a, a highly affinitive uh, ligand for the biotin. And with this enrichment, we can analyze this conjugate with the LCMS uh, mass spectrometer. And then with some uh, integrated uh, quantitative analysis, we can decode the interactome of the protein of interest. So the uh, specific interaction we are interested in is the interaction between proteins and the so-called long non-coding RNAs. And as I introduced earlier, we have the central dogma that the DNA transcribed into mRNA and then it translated into protein. However, later research actually found out that for all the transcribed uh, DNA molecule, actually only 2% of the RNA are encoding the protein. The majority of the transcribed RNAs are actually the so-called non-coding RNAs shown here. And depending on their lengths, they are uh, divided into two categories, the microRNAs as well as the long non-coding RNAs, which are short form called link RNAs. And then the link RNAs have many uh, important functions, as we found out. And these are including the uh, many important regulatory roles in the central dogma, like acting at the DNA level, as well as the RNA and the protein level. And then the major functional mechanism for the link RNAs are through working together with their binding protein partners. For example, the RNA link RNAs can recruit uh, some functional proteins to their specific functional target. In this way, it's providing a guiding role. And at the same time, the link RNA can serve as a scaffold to bring together several proteins together to form a complex to execute their function. And, this, and uh, in addition to that, the link RNAs can also function as a decoy to trap the proteins and keep them from acting on certain functional site. So these uh, functions all depending on the interaction between the link RNA and their functional interacting protein partners. So the challenge in the field is 
actually for a given pro, uh, RNA of uh, interest, how do we decode its protein interacting partner or interacting uh, or interactomes? So to solve this problem, we took advantage of the uh, newly developed uh, CRISPR-Cas technology. And it was a technology originally found, uh, discovered in bacteria that some uh, so-called Cas protein, they can be guided to a specific DNA or RNA sequence with the help of guide RNAs. And there the Cas protein can cleave the uh, specific DNA or RNA sequences. This technology was originally uh, identified in the, um, 1987, and then later on it have boosted the uh, development of many biotechnology, including the genome targeting technology, and it was awarded the Nobel Prize of Chemistry last year. And for us, we, because we want to study the uh, interactome of uh, link RNA, so we took advantage of the Cas13 protein, which uh, target the RNA protein. And then we destroyed the uh, uh, nucleus function of the uh, DCAS13 so that it can only be targeted to the RNA sequence without cleaving it. And we, in this work, we actually uh, integrated it together with the proximity ligation technology that I introduced above and developed a, tech, a new method called the CRISPR-assisted RNA protein interaction detection, in short form called CARPET. And in this, form, in this work, actually, the DCASRX protein was fused to a biotin ligase called BASU, and then we overexpressed them in the cells, and the, uh, this fusion protein will be guided to the R link RNA of interest by a guide RNA. And there, the basu uh, ligase will be activated by the addition of biotin, and it will basically biotinylate all the proteins in the vicinity of it. And then, in other words, the binding protein of the link RNA. And with this, we can pull down and enrich the um, RNA binding proteins, and then later on, we can have the Western block and uh, mass spec identification of them. And this work was published last year in Nature Method, and it was uh, through a collaboration with uh, Dr. Yan Jia and Ming Chen in the department as well. And then briefly in the work, we identified the interactome of three different link RNAs. And uh, as shown here is that our results are very specific, meaning that each link RNA exists, but at one or denser, we can identify a different set of their interactome. And in the middle is basically a key step in the uh, carpet method, which we utilize the uh, comparative uh, subtraction to find out the actual uh, interacting protein enriched through the mass spec. And then to the right is the validation step, is where we uh, validated several newly identified binding partner of the link on exist where we uh, identify the protein SNF2L and the TAF15. On here, we show that they actually interact with the um, cyst link RNA inside the nucleus, which are shown on here as the red color, and then the green color are the proteins, and we show that they co-localize with each other. And briefly, with this uh, uh, carpet method, we can develop, uh, we can identify the link RNA binding proteome in the native cellular status with high specificity. And our next step is going to uh, utilize this method and integrate it with other technology to study the dynamics of uh, RNA protein interaction in subcellular uh, compartment. That's one direction. And after that, I think I'll int briefly introduce another piece of work in the precision medicine direction using proteomics, which uh, we call the um, IGAP, stands for the immunoglobulin associated to the proteome. And this work is uh, under uh, minor revision at this moment. And the target that we are uh, interested in is the immunoglobulin. I think everybody is familiar with the protein antibody, which we know it, the immunoglobulin uh, commonly as, okay? And they are the immune molecules secreted by the B cells to fight the intruding uh, pathogens normally. 
And then later research have found out that uh, some other cells types can also secrete uh, immunoglobulin as well. And then the immunoglobulins can have additional functions such as uh, signaling uh, transduction in addition to neutralizing the intruding pathogens. And then uh, the functional mechanism of uh, uh, antibodies or immunoglobulins is by forming the immunocomplexes. Basically, it will recognize and bind to the uh, interacting partners and trigger downstream reactions. So based on this feature, we uh, had a hypothesis is that if we can use proteomics to deconvolve the immune complexes of uh, the immunoglobulins, whether uh, maybe we can have some like predictive value for the disease status of the individual. So we think that by convolving the immune complexes, we can have some new biomarkers for disease diagnosis. So for that, we basically took the uh, quantitative proteomics to analyze the immunocomplex and developed this uh, IGAP uh, workflow. So our focus were originally on cancer and other in infectious disease, but later on we were actually diverged onto the uh, disease state of the coronary artery disease or the heart disease. And we all know that the coronary artery disease refers to a, a status that the, some atherosclerotic plaques are formed in the coronary artery of the heart. And when it's developing, the heart will be lack of uh, uh, blood supply and the patient will have some uh, problems. And they, then they are at the stage of chronic coronary syndrome. And then when the plaque fully developed to complete block the uh, artery, then some, uh, this leads to the acute myocardial infarction status, which is a life-threatening uh, life condition. And research have found that the uh, atherosclerosis and the plaque development is a chronic immune uh, disease. And the many antibodies are actually found in the plaques and some uh, subtypes of immunoglobulins are like uh, have predictive power of it, but then people uh, didn't understand the mechanism and didn't understand their target as well. So for that, we actually recruited different uh, patients of a different stage of the disease. And we have some dozens of uh, patients at the acute male infarction disease uh, stage or the chronic stage, and we also have some non-heart disease patient. What we did was we uh, isolated and purified the immune complexes, and we just sim simply send them for mass spec analysis, and with the proteomic analysis, we hope to uh, categorize different patients and identify novel biomarker. And the primary uh, and the preliminary results showed very promising because here on this graph, the yellow colored patients are the um, chronic uh, disease patient, and then the red colored patients are the ones with the uh, acute infarction. And we show that their uh, proteomic profile of the IGAP can complete separate them, okay, and they have different quantitative information. And we were encouraged by this, and then we looked for the differential proteins of the RGAP, and uh, with that we can identify the uh, proteins that specifically enriched in the acute infarction uh, patient. And uh, uh, interestingly, they are all enriched in the protein uh, signaling pathways of the coagulation cascade or lipoprotein transport uh, pathways, and all are in implicated in the development of atherosclerosis. And we uh, were excited about this, so we collaborated with uh, Dr. Wang Xin, a former colleague in the department, who uh, actually helped us uh, did some uh, uh, regressional modeling to identify the candidate biomarker to separate the acute infarction patient with the chronic patient. And with that analysis, we could develop a biomarker of uh, factor 10, which uh, we think is a candidate biomarker 
to tell apart the uh, acute infarction from the chronic patient. Uh, we're, we are working on a uh, larger patient cohort to see the predictive value of this uh, biomarker. And with that uh, summarized, the second part is that we have the R -gap, uh, I gap uh, uh, pipeline to basically analyze the immune complexes to identify disease biomarkers. And we have the identified IGAP factor 10 as a potential diagnostic uh, biomarker for infarction and chronic uh, heart disease. And we are working on expanding the uh, IGAP pipeline to other diseases such as cancer and infectious disease. And with that, I'd like to thank all my current and the previous lab members uh, who contributed to the, pre uh, to the talks that uh, I covered, as well the uh, Dr. Yan Jian and Ming Chen. Uh, we collaborated on the uh, carpet project, and Dr. Wang Xin, and also Dr. Qiu Xiaoyan and uh, Chen Yundai from Peking University. We collaborated on the IGAP project and also all the funding support. Thank you all for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any question for the audience? Yeah, Bruce again. That was a particularly clear talk. Nice going. Thank you. We've come a long way since Watson and Crick, and uh, if you haven't been paying attention to the details, uh, it would be very easy to be completely lost today. Um, I have a, a, a single question from a purely clinical perspective. Is this chicken or egg? Uh, in other words, are you seeing things that have developed because of hypercholesterolemia uh, and some other bad genes that predispose to poor cholesterol metabolism? Or are you seeing something that actually generates uh, the bad environment which produces uh, cholesterol mal metabolism? Uh, that's a great question. Thanks for it. And then basically, uh, we think the immunoglobulins or the antibodies, we think they probably function as some uh, surveilling molecule in our body to detect any abnormal events. Like you said, the high like lipid level and then or the oxidation of the lipid may lead to some uh, abnormal event in the body that can be picked up by the uh, immunoglobulin. That's another uh, direction in the project is we try to isolate the uh, recognized molecule and we want to see what abnormal modification on them that can be linked to the development of the disease or have any diagnostic value. There was a little confusing in the talk whether it was intended as a diagnostic strategy or as uh, an explanation for pathogenesis. So I just All right. Point the, out. I think the effort now is to uh, focus on the diagnostic potential at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please. Um, Would you be able to characterize whether the binding of the antibody to those proteins are specific or not? Or in other words, do, do these interactions through the antigen, through the antigen binding domain? So that, that's another question actually the reviewer asked us as well. It's like whether this is, there is a new epitope on it. We, at this moment, we don't know. And then, but there are other publications uh, did mention during the development of atherosclerosis, there could be like a new epitope, like new PTM developed on the uh, LDL protein as well that can be uh, picked up by antibodies. So we think it may be, but then it needs further experiment to identify it and validate it. Yes, Mr. Du? In electrochemical reaction, electrochemical, we always worry charge transfer. So in 
bioelectrical reaction, you have protein uh, DNA. Any charge transfer you worry or you don't? Electrical charge, what that means, very simple. Right. Um, I, I don't know how to specifically answer the question, but then the electrode, the charge difference, are actually the mechanism that basically different PTM can give different function or property of the protein. It basically changes the local electrode property of the protein so that they have a different conformation and they have a different interacting partner and so on. So we do concern about that. In the experiment, when we purify the com uh, complexes, we do keep the uh, condition consistent in that case. No, no, your molecules are much bigger, OK? But right. uh, I think charge will always stay alive. Right. Thank you. OK, thank you. Any question? Oh, uh, Professor Wang. Uh, Zhang Liang is uh, very interesting. Uh, for the function of many proteins, particularly those uh, enzyme, kinase, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, those are modification, phosphorylation, or this, any of those modification is extremely important. And then in your first talk, your model, you have a link RNA, my form a complex with some functional protein. And how that going to affect the protein activity? Yeah, I think uh, there have been studies about the function of the link RNAs, what happens after it recruits the protein. So it depends on the different uh, context. So for example, the link RNAs, they can recruit like the histone uh, uh, acetylase. And then in that case, that will be an activating complex. But then whether it's up to the link RNA itself activating it, or then like I showed in the middle, there are some scaffolding function of it to bring in another enzyme to activate this protein. So it's all like context dependent, and then depending on the partners. My, my second question, because you, you mentioned the immunoglobulin, uh, mm -hmm. actually those are uh, studies uh, in the past, uh, probably most recent too, in the hypertension, for example, patients normally, I cannot remember which type, uh, they have increased, they find acting on the vascular wall and uh, you know, make things worse. And uh, in your, I think Bruce asked a very good question, because you use acute heart attack, the patients, and uh, normally those patients have many background diseases. Diabetes, hypertension, many little things. Uh, so, so that probably need to think of something you want to develop as a, in the potential by market value. Would that be uh, need to think of this more carefully? Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any question from the students here? Mm. Any question? Well, if no question, then we will thank Professor Zhang again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And our third speaker will be Dr. Kuo An Lei, Li Guo An Jiao Okay, and he received his bachelor degree in biochemistry from University of Hong Kong in 1993, and his master and PhD degree from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in 1995 and 2001. And upon receiving a Crunchyroll Foundation Fellowship in 2003, uh, sorry, uh, he continued to work as a postdoc fellow at UCLA. And he was a research assistant professor in Hong Kong UST in 2008. And then worked as an assistant professor in University of Hong Kong from 2014. And early this year, he joined CTU as assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience. And Dr. Lei 
has been using molecular and imaging approaches to study the cell biology and neuron, and his research focused on the interplay between the intercellular transport, signal transduction, and the syntactic, uh, uh, synaptic functions of neuron. And this could have important implication in understanding the molecular basis of brain functions, such as learning and memory. And his recent research include using genome editing on human stem cell-derived neuron to investigate disease-associated uh, genetic mutation on RNA binding proteins. And Dr. Li has also more than uh, around 40 papers with total citation a couple thousand times, and including papers in nature, uh, nature neuroscience, nature communication, science signal, uh, signaling and penis, e-life and cell report and so on. And he has been the highlight as faculty of 1000 biology. And he has served as an editorial board in scientific reports and frontier in molecular neuroscience and co-chair multiple international conferences, including the Golden Research Seminar and some other symposium. Very distinguished. So let's welcome uh, Professor Li Guan. Yeah. So thank you very much, Professor Huang, for the very kind introduction, and also all the uh, members of the IAS, the department, and the college for nominating me as the, uh, uh, for this very uh, honorable uh, lecture series. Now today I'm going to talk about two things, uh, which is pretty much summarized in these two pictures. One is RNA transport, so you see all these yellow dots here. These are RNA granules happen in the neuron. And then why the RNA transport is important? Because they are the one that underlie the formation of those connections between neurons in the brain. Now, you all know that neuron is very much different from other cell types because they need to communicate with each other. So therefore, they need to uh, form extensive connections. So as such, they have to uh, extend long processes called axons and dendrites. So axons are the ones that send out information to other neurons while dendrites are the ones that receive information from other neurons. Now on those processes, we have a specialized compartment here, which is called a synapse, which composed of three major components. One is the presynaptic terminal, which is uh, from the axon of one neuron, and then it contains a lot of vesicles, which are, are contained in neurotransmitter. And then upon stimulation of this presynaptic neuron, the neurotransmitter will be released, and then binds to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron and uh, trigger neurotransmission. And if it, is, uh, if it is an excitatory synapse, then the postsynaptic neuron can become activated. And on top of that, we also have the astrocyte uh, process that help the uh, synapse to uh, form and function. Now, we often say that the neuron is highly compartmentalized because all these cellular compartments, the axon, dendrites, pre- and postsynaptic uh, uh, sites, they have their own function, and therefore they also have their own uh, protein composition. Now, one of the compartments that we are, uh, have been particularly interested is the dendritic spine, which is where the postsynaptic component is located. Now, the dendritic spines have different shapes, and the one that looked like the mushroom are the mature ones, which believe to be important for the consolidation of memory in the adult brain. But on the other side of the spectrum, we also have these very long uh, philopodia, which are more prominent in the developing brain. And in the mature brain, they supposedly need to be disappeared and replaced by the mushroom spines. Now, we know that the spines are important for our brain function because uh, the abnormality of spine number or morphology is associated with various brain disorders. So for example, if you look at Angelman syndrome or Down syndrome, you get fewer spines. 
On the other hand, in tuberous sclerosis, you actually have more spines. So having more spines will make, will make you smarter, but it actually can be problematic. Now, in some cases, you actually have similar spine number with the normal individual, but then the spine morphology becomes abnormal. They become more elongated, and this can also be problematic. Now, the spine is actually very dynamic, and it needs ongoing signaling uh, 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 transduction pathway to maintain their uh, proper uh, morphology. So, for example, if you uh, block synaptic activity using the drug AP5, then you can see a lot of mushroom spines become disappear, and you only remain the thinner spines. On the other hand, if you can acutely activate the spine using uncaging glutamate, you can see there is a, a rapid enlargement of the dendritic spine, which is coupled to the uh, enhanced synaptic transmission efficacy. So throughout many years, I have been interested to study how the signaling pathways control the uh, dynamic aspect of the spine formation as well as their modulation. And we know that one very important signaling is involving the actin dynamics because we have a lot of actin filaments within the spine. But the diagram here shown me is actually much more simplistic than our real, uh, the real life situation. So it's actually a lot more complicated in terms of how these actin dynamics is controlled within the spine. Now today I'm going to focus on one particular process and that is the transport of RNA within the neuron and how they might be involved in controlling the synapse development. Now neuron has long been a great model to study intracellular transport, but it's actually very challenging because you can imagine that the uh, process, whether it's axon or dendrite, can be very long. So the transport of material from the cell body all the way to the distal part can involve a very long distance, as much as one meter for some of the axons. The other problem is about specificity, because each compartment has their own uh, protein composition. So you can imagine that if an axon protein is being mistargeted to the dendrite, it's actually become problematic. So you need to have some kind of specificity. So in neuron, there is actually a very important a sophisticated uh, transport mechanism that underlies this long uh, distance transport of materials. Now my interest uh, with the uh, intracellular transport in neurons started when I worked with uh, Kelsey Martin at UCLA. So at that time she actually has a very intriguing findings. She found that there is a nuclear protein called uh, importing alpha, which has long been known to be important for shutting protein into the nucleus. What she found is that the important alpha, surprisingly, is found at the synapse. So at that time, we kind of think that, well, maybe there is some transcription factor that can move by the importing all the way from the distal site into the nucleus. So what we did is we tried to look at the transport of a transcription factor called CRAP2, which is found in the dendrite. But you can imagine that the uh, monitoring of protein transport in, at this particular case is quite challenging because the protein is soluble, so it's not packed in a granules or vesicles. So how can we follow the uh, transport of a soluble protein? So in that case, we actually use a uh, protein which can be photoconverted, called dendra. So if you use a field diaphragm that can limit the UV light within a small area that is far away from the uh, cell body, you can create a pool of red fluorescent protein which allow us to track their uh, real-time movement from the distal process all the way into the nucleus. And then we found that if you use a peptide that block the interaction between CRAP2 and the importing alpha, you completely abolish this retrograde transport of the protein from the dendrite into the nucleus. Now today, what I'm going to tell you about is the transport of material from the reverse direction. That is, after transcription, how the mRNA is being transported from the cell body to the distal site. Now the idea that you can have local protein synthesis far away from the cell body is not new. It's actually first identified uh, in 1982 by Ossie Stewart. 
in which they found that polyribosomes can be found at the base of a dendritic spine. So this suggests that you can actually have protein synthesis far away from the cell body. But of course, in order to have local protein synthesis in the synapse, you need to first move the mRNA from the cell body to the distal site. And this cannot be achieved by simple diffusion. So the RNA has first to be assembled into granules by forming a complex with RNA binding proteins, and then the granules will be transported along the microtubule through the motor proteins, which could be either kinesin or dynein. So you can see it's actually a uh, process that requires a lot of energy. So you might want to ask why we need to transport the RNA for local protein synthesis. Why don't we just simply restrict the protein synthesis in the cell body and then move the proteins? Now there are at least three reasons why you need local protein synthesis. First is that in neurons, there are actually a lot of proteins that they need for its proper function. So if you just look at the synapse, even though it's very small, it can have up to a thousand different proteins within the postsynaptic density. And if you consider that you can have 10,000 different uh, synapses within a neuron, the energy demand of a neuron is really high. So just having a cell body to make protein is simply not enough. The other reason is that it's actually more economical to transport RNA. Because if you assume that the energy to transport RNA and protein is more or less the same, but if you transport the RNA to the process, one single RNA copy can make many proteins. So it's actually more economical. But the third reason, which is probably more important, is that it actually allows you to have a spatial and temporal regulation of protein composition at the distal site. So we know that the RNA, when during transported, they are translationally silent, so they cannot make any proteins. Only when it reaches the destination and then when there is a suitable uh, extracellular signal, then the RNA can make protein. So therefore, it allows you to have a spatial control such that only the places where you need the new proteins will have the synthesis of protein from the mRNA. So these are the major reasons. So in our lab, we are interested in a number of questions related to RNA transport. So one of them is how the mRNA are transported in the dendrite, and in particular, how specific and heterogeneous is the transport of the mRNA. And the second uh, question we want to ask is what are the dendritic mRNAs and how might they be involved in the uh, development and function of the synapse? And if, if time allowed, then I will talk uh, briefly about uh, the defects of RNA binding proteins and brain disorders. So first about RNA transport and specificity. Now we actually have 45 different motor proteins that are involved in the transport of materials in the neuron. So one of the questions that I want to ask is whether all these motor proteins have similar function or not. So in a way, it's kind of analogous to the taxis in Hong Kong. So you know that we have three different types of taxi. And which one you want to get on depends on where you want to go. So where similar things happen in the neuron or not, do different kinesins have different functions? So towards this end, we want to focus on this particular group of kinesin called kinesin 1, which is the founding member of the kinesin superfamily, uh, first being identified by uh, Scott Brady and Ron Vail back in 1985. Now kinesin 1 is the major kinesin motor that is associated with RNA binding proteins. And uh, in the vertebrates, we have three different kinesins called 5A, 5B, and 5C which are very similar to each other. So people think that they kind of have a very similar and maybe redundant function. Now, if you look at their structure, indeed, they are all very similar in various domains, except the very C-terminus N, which are very diverse between the three different proteins. Now, people actually didn't really care too much about these regions. They think that they might not be very important because they are not conserved between the different members. And when we look at the expression of the three different kinesins in the hippocampus, which is the region important for learning and memory, we found that they actually have very similar expression pattern. However, when we try to knock down individual K5 using shRNA, something very surprising happened. We found that if you knock down K5B, you see a very severe phenotype. So we look at the minis, which represent the synaptic events. 
if you're not done K5B, you see much fewer synaptic events. However, if you're not done K5A, you don't see any change. And similarly, if we look at the dendritic spines, we also found that not done K5A, nothing happened. Not done K5B, you lose a lot of the mushroom spines. So this suggests that these two motors have very different functions. Now to confirm that indeed this is the case, we do a rescue experiment. So we're not done K5B, and then put back K5B, we are now able to see now the mushroom spines are being regained. You put back K5A, nothing happened. So you still see the loss of dendritic spines. And importantly, if you now make a chimera such that you get rid of this carboxy tail and then replace with that of K5B, now you gain the function again. So these uh, studies suggest that the C terminus of K5B is indeed important to determine its functional specificity. So what's so special about this C terminus? We went on to find that the C terminus of K5B is important for its binding to two RNA binding proteins, namely the FMRP and the GVBP1. So these two proteins are found in the dendrite and are known to be important for dendritic transport of RNA. To confirm that indeed this is the case, we not done the K5A or K5B using SHRNA, and then we do live imaging to look at the transport of the GFP tag FMRP and found that while the velocity of the granules are not significantly changed, if you're not done K5B, you actually lose the uh, granules in the dendrite. And then we also look at some of the cargo of RNA which has been known to bind to FMRP, such as CAM kinase 2, and found that if you're not done K5B, you see fewer CAM kinase 2 mRNA in the dendrite, but not K5A. So these studies are actually, uh, we further confirm using the uh, conditional knockout mice that if you knock out K5B only in the forebrain but not the other two uh, kinase motors, it will lead to a memory loss of the mice. So in that particular case, we do a Barnes maze, which is a spatial learning task, and find that for conditional knockout mice that lack K5B, they actually spend more time to find out the escape route, meaning that their spatial memory is affected. Furthermore, we look at the hippocampus and found that if you knock out K5B, you see fewer dendritic spines, and this is coupled with an impairment of the excitatory synaptic transmission, as well as the defects in LTP, which is a form of synaptic plasticity related to learning and memory. So these data suggest that these two kinesin indeed have different functions in terms of the excitatory synapse development as well as the transport of mRNA. But more interestingly, if you try to look at our study together with the, uh, the earlier study by Hirokawa's lab, in which they show that the K5A is more specifically involved in the uh, development of inhibitory synapse, so these together suggest that we actually have different kinesin. Some of them are more important for the excitatory synapse, while others are more important uh, for the inhibitory synapse. So again, go back to this scenario. We indeed have different kinesin that look like the different taxis that depending on where you go and what kind of synapse you want to maintain, you will hope up to a different kinesin. So we talk about the motor, but how about the RNA? Now we have uh, uh, approximately more than 2,000 different mRNAs that can be found in either the axon or dendrite. So can different mRNAs be hooked up on the same granule and motor, or individual mRNA might be transported individually to different places? Now indeed, there are two papers suggest that uh, this is indeed the case. So individual mRNA can be packed into single granules, and if that's the case, one of the questions that we really want to ask is whether different mRNAs will go to different destinations within the dendrite. The idea is that the R R MS2 system allows you to actually look at the transport of RNA granules in real time. And so, for example, here you can see two granules uh, at this particular position, uh, one, uh, one second. But then after five seconds, they are able to move 
uh, either from the retrograde uh, direction or anterior grade uh, direction to the new position. And then we can also use uh, metabolic labeling to uh, look at the newly synthesized protein and try to identify where is the site of uh, translation of my uh, uh, studies in the lab. So basically, uh, we show you that you can indeed have a specificity of RNA transport in dendrite, where we show that two similar key 5 motors have non-redundant functions in terms of synapse development and RNA transport. And also we found that different mRNAs can have heterogeneous localization in the dendrite. And I don't have time to show you, but uh, we found that if you look at the database, and try to characterize some of the dendritic mRNAs, we are able to identify new signaling molecules that control synapse development and maturation, and also try to understand some of the disease proteins. And with that, I want to thank my uh, students, past and present, as well as many of the collaborators. Some of them are involved in the kinesin work, and we are also uh, collaborating with uh, Julian, trying to use aptoma to look at RNA transport in real time. Draft from CUHK tried to study the localization of circular RNA. And Otan from Arikin tried to look at how RNA methylation affects synapse development. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> any question, uh, please, Mr. King? Well, I have actually two questions. Yeah. First one is, those mRNA transport, is it signal dependent? In other words, more mRNA vesicle, they transport to the dendrite with more spine, or less vesicle is transported to the dendrite with less spine? So in other words, is there any signal to recruit the that mRNA? That's the first question. And oh, second question is, that mRNA is it really co-transport with the ribosome, because Dr. Zhang Yang said the central dogma, the second part is the translation, so mRNA is transported, it needs the ribosome, so. Okay, yes. yeah, so thanks for the question. So for the first question, we know that the uh, synaptic activity can actually drive the RNA to the spine. Okay, so it has been shown that if you have stimulus such as chemical LTP or uncaging glutamate, and then you can see the RNA can be recruited to the spine at real time, so this is, uh, the, the answer to your first question. And for your second question, we think that the ribosome is actually in the granule. So the RNA, when they are in the granule, they have to be kept translationally silent. So you have ribosome, but you also have a lot of RNA binding proteins, which prevent the RNA to get translated when they are transported. So and only when they reach the destination and then you have a signal such as synaptic activity, then you can release the RNA from the granules and then you can start the translation. Can I ask one more question? Yes, Just, I'm very curious. In the introduction, you said the CREP is detected in a, in a, in a, yeah. in a digital process. Yeah. Yes. What CREP is doing there? Because that's very well known transcription factor. Yeah. Right? So the idea is that you have a transcription factor from the dendrite or synapse such that if you have a signal which can induce the translocation back to the nucleus, then you can turn on certain gene that will change the synaptic strength over there. And this has actually been proved since our 2008 paper. A lot of other synapse to our nucleus messengers have been identified. And then if you have stimulus such as activation of NMDA receptor, you can actually drive the translocation all the way to the nucleus and then affect gene transcription. Bruce? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jacob, I just have to say, uh, kind of as an overarching comment, what terrific lectures and what good news for City University to have this kind of young bunch of people coming up. So, uh, great lecture, uh, perfectly clear, and uh, certainly taught me some things I didn't know. I am concerned about my, uh, my synaptic spines because as you get older you start losing synaptic spines and yeah. if you are unlucky enough to develop a dementing illness you lose them by the score. Um, my question is what percent of protein that works to keep our dendrites healthy 
is manufactured locally versus the percentage that's sent down as pre-manufactured proteins? Because that's a huge deal. Yeah. That's a great question. So a lot of people say that, okay, you have mRNA, but so what? I mean, how do you know that they're actually translated? So there is a recent study published in Nature Communication in which they use ribosome. This is so the I, uh, immunoprecipitate, the ribosome, and then look at what are the RNA that are associated with the ribosome. So those are the ones that supposedly undergo translation. And then they found that for those proteins that are in the neuron, whether it's axon or dendrite, about half of them, they actually associate with the, the mRNA are actually associated with the ribosome. So it suggests that half of the proteins in the axon and dendrite can be locally translated. So that's actually a large extent. It's not just one or two mRNA that can be locally yeah, translated. Yeah, that's a whole new principle. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Du. In your slide, you mentioned long distance transport between in yeah. Europe. Yeah. Now, if I cut my finger, right away I feel it. Yeah. This is signal is so fast. Yeah, sure. I wonder how do you do that? Because according to solid state diffusion, like a, no way is so fast. So you mentioned the end joint like that. So I don't understand, but would you explain okay. it one more time? Now, when you send something like a pain signal, it's travel fast because it is actually electrical signal, it's action potential. So it can actually transport all the way to your brain within seconds. But what we are talking about, like the dendritic transport RNA or protein, we are talking something more long term. So for example, let's imagine that you have the axon terminus, which have a lot of proteins. These proteins can only have a half-life of, say, a few days. So how can you replace those proteins? Then you have to make new proteins. So as such, you need to transport the RNA to those digital sites. There. So the RNA is already there, and then you can make them when it is necessary. So for example, your pre-existing proteins start to degrade it, then you can have newly synthesized protein to replace them. So we are talking about those long-term replacements. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but not like something that occurs really fast, <coughs> such as the sensation, which of course takes less than one second in order for you to feel the sensation. Uh, I would like to ask a uh, naive technical question. Yeah. Uh, as you see, there's uh, about over 2,000 mRNAs localized in the dendrites. Yeah. So actually, technically, how to differentiate this kind of the, uh, transcriptome assays, uh, different from the, the, the neural body and the dendrites and also, uh, also neutrons? How can you Make sure that kind of pro that kind of MRI is not contaminated from different places. Okay. Yeah. So of course this is a, a very important question. So whenever you do any kind of transcriptomic study, you try to you know isolate different compartments. There is always the possibility that there is contamination, no matter how how little is contamination. So that's why after all these uh, uh, large scale study, you need to pick some of those to validate using in situ hybridization, for example, to make sure that indeed you have RNA that can be found at the synapse or in, That's in okay. the- That's okay, but in that case, you have to, to you know, validate one by one over 2,000 times. Yeah, unfortunately, you cannot, I mean, you can never rule out contamination. Whether you, well, there are different ways you can do it. Either you can cut out the neural peel, you can make synaptic neurosome, you can, under the microscope, try to cut out the, the axon and dendrite from single neuron. You can do and everything. But regardless, whenever you do all these large-scale transcriptome protein study, you can never 100% rule out the possibility. So, so of now you mentioned that to cut out the the you know the dendrites uh, in the culture cells. Yeah, you can do that. Even though we didn't do that in our own, but That's there are right. studies. But nonetheless, you know because you have many transcripts, so if this is completely due to contamination, you will see all the contamination. But you can see some transcripts being enriched but not others. So this gives you some kind of confidence that what you observe is not simply contamination. Great, Professor He Chifeng. Yeah. Yeah, uh, on a very, very nice talk. Is I just wonder how, uh, how long do you think those uh, uh, membrane, uh, membrane protein, like uh, uh, you know, receptors, 
uh, glutamate receptor, AMPA receptor, and uh, NMDA receptor, or other receptors. How long do you think they, can, they, w they need to be replaced? I'm not 100% about the half-life, but usually in general, protein half-life can be in the range of one to two days to at most, I would say, two weeks. It's seldom that protein can be more stable than two weeks. Okay, so from my point, you know, just the uh, AMPA receptor, this mm -hmm. is about the you know, trans uh, you know, signal transmission, right? And there's also memory that associate with those receptors. Yeah. So if I, try, I had some kind of memory there, I don't want them, I lose them. Mm -hmm. So in another way, if, any pos if possible, I like those receptors in the membrane to stay forever. So why do they need to be replaced? That's my question. So the thing is, there is a concept of so-called synaptic tagging. So the idea is that if you want to have a synapse that have a persistent strengthening, for long-term memory. The synapse is tagged. Now the proteins within the synapse is actually keep degraded. I mean, the proteins cannot stay there forever. But if you tag that particular synapse, what we believe is that the mRNA make new proteins and those new proteins can selectively go to this particular tag synapse. So you can have replacement of new proteins, including AMPA receptor, NMDA receptor, within this tag synapse. So therefore you won't lose the uh, synaptic strength because yeah. it gets tagged to get replacement. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to look at a, a different angle. If mm -hmm. this is a kind of infrastructure, so once you made, you don't want to, to kind of replace it all the time, right? So in other words, that's uh -huh. a lot of huge work for the neuron network, every neuron, every different part of the neuron mm -hmm. to do that job. So if possible. So I think for the efficiency, we better not to replace them. <laughs> so, so, so this, this is, I'm not yeah, sure. I mean, you, you, yeah, you, I understand you your point. But, you but, but my, my understanding is there is no, no study saying that, that you, you know, you can have proteins get and last for your whole life. I mean, memory can last for a whole life, but protein, I don't know. I don't think there is ever any protein that can persist for that long. So you need replacement anyway. On a, a very interesting uh, uh, talk, and I also learned something. But you also you only mentioned about messenger RNA transport in the mm -hmm. the dendrites or dendritic spine, but not in the axon. Well, actually, axon also have mRNA, and indeed, people found that there are even more mRNA in the axon. But uh, you know, there is a diverse view of uh, about local translation in axon. So. People pretty much know that in the growth comb of a developing axon, they have local translation. Probably the dendrite provide more surface yeah. area for interaction with other neurons. My, my question, for example, if you control your neuronal activity, yeah. for example, you keep firing soma, mm -hmm. would that somehow affect the speed or the content of those messenger RNA, uh, the transport, and then down to the nerve terminal, then start to process, for example, particular type of, uh, uh, because some neurotransmitter will be depleted. Yeah. And that signal will be somehow pick up. They decide, okay, now I want to do something to replace uh, those protein which has been partially depleted. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not quite sure whether people show that in axon, but in dendrite, definitely. If you depolarize the neuron with KCL, for example, you see more RNA move to the dendrite. But surprisingly, people actually didn't do that for axon, I guess. But I mean, you're right. I mean, if you have a strong firing, then you deplete neurotransmitter, you might actually need more, you know, axon being synthesizing uh, protein in order to replace this. Because in the synapse, only, I would think, three proteins are important, ion channels, and the receptors, which can be ion channels. Mm -hmm. And then another is the transporters. Sometimes they take things back, like catecholamine, for example. Yeah. So those are... Those you think is uh, under the con local control? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. even though, I mean, as I show you, we actually have 1,000 different proteins yes. at the synapse. So, I mean, obviously you are right that you have three major types, but all the other proteins, they're also important to maintain, for example, the dendritic spine dynamics and all that. So they're also important. And perhaps it is those that are actually locally translated. 
because you need to turn them on or off in order to control the synapse. So instead of just uh, having those neurotransmitter receptors or neurotransmitter release, if you turn those uh, accessory so uh, molecules that control the synapse function, is actually a way to control how the synaptic transmission So is. in what condition you think once transported to the nerve terminal, and they will come back, uh, back to the soma, would that be possible? You mean mRNA? Yes. No, I think once they transport there, they, they make use, protein they and then they will get degraded. So RNA will also get degraded. And surprisingly, the enzyme that degrade RNA can also be found local. So that means you can have local RNA degradation. You don't need to move the RNA back to the cell body to get degraded. Right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think probably time's up. So uh, I think we have a three great talk. So congratulations to CDU to have a three young talents. So uh, if you're interested, you can discuss with them in the future. So let's give them three all a big applause. <laughs> so we would like to represent IS to give them some certificate plus a, a mini project. Not big, uh, should be good enough for them to hire a postdoc or two PhD student, something like that. So uh, I, I'm sure they would be happy. So the first one will be uh, Professor Lu. So this one will help you to be promoted to full professor. Thank you. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Second one, Professor Zhang Liang. Thank you. 